So hi, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you're connecting. We are global after all. My name is Nina Sun, and I'm the Deputy Director of Global Health here at the Dornsife School of Public Health. And I'm also an assistant clinical professor in the Department of Community Health and Prevention. At heart, regardless of titles, though, I am a health and human rights lawyer and advocate, and I am extremely pleased today to be joined by wonderful advocates themselves, Pyle Shaw, who's the director of the Sexual Violence and Conflict Program at Physicians for Human Rights, as well as Tom McHale, who's the deputy director. Um, so for those of you who are not familiar with the work of Physicians for Human Rights, it's an organization that works at the intersection of medicine, science, and law to advance justice and human rights globally. And one of the key programs that PHR has been doing over the past couple of decades is looking at documentation and accountability for sexual violence during conflict. And some of you may have noticed the renewed attention to this topic, um, given the news coverage of what's going on in the Ukraine conflict. But unfortunately, this is a pattern that has gone on that, that has reoccurred in many conflict situations, which Pyle and Tom will highlight in the work of PHR. So I'm also, before we get started and I pass the floor over to them, I wanted to give a bit of background about our speakers. So Pyle, in addition to being the director of the program, has over 15 years of experience as also a wonderful human rights lawyer specializing in sexual and reproductive health. And before PHR, she spent several years at the Center for Reproductive Rights, culminating in leading their Asia program. Tom, um, as the deputy director of the program at PHR, uh, is a global health professional with over a decade of experience in this type of work. He's been with PHR for eight years. And before PHR, he was with JSI doing some work on HIV prevention and maternal and child health. So we are in very good hands um, with health and human rights advocates. And without further ado, I'd like to pass the floor over to Pyle and Tom. And I wanted to also alert the attendees that while you listen to their presentation, please feel free to send any questions that you might have for them in the Q&A or the chat, and we'll get to them after the presentation. So Pyle and Tom, over to you. Thank you so much, Nina. Um, thank you so much for to Drexel for inviting us here today, and, and Nina for all of your work coordinating. Um, and we're really thrilled to have the opportunity to speak with all of you. Um, so thank you for attending during what I'm sure is a, a busy day. Um, so for today, um, we thought we would share a bit about um, PHR, but starting first with you know this intersection that Nina mentioned around health and human rights and really unpacking a bit of what specifically is the role of health professionals in protecting and promoting human rights. From there, we were gonna flow into um, an overview of PHR and our work with health professionals to investigate and document human rights violations and advocate for meaningful change and then to move into a case study of PHR's work in documenting human rights violations um, using the unique voice and perspectives of healthcare providers. So we'll start um, with the overview of PHR uh, and then move into case studies. So PHR uses science and medicine to establish a fact-based record of human rights violations. Well, you know, the way that we work is really understanding that physicians, scientists, and other health professionals have unique skills to support a dignified medical legal response to survivors. And these professionals lend significant rigor and credibility to investigation and documentation of human rights abuses. So we work to expose the truth where evidence is hidden, poorly understood and contested. And as you can see on this slide, we work across many different areas. Of course, today we're going to be discussing PHR's work in sexual violence and conflict zones, uh, but we also work on, on other forms of torture, uh, detention and cruel and human degrading treatment. We work on mass atrocities, um, on persecution of health professionals and attacks on healthcare facilities, um, as well as helping survivors of grave human rights violations obtain asylum here in the US. So as I noted, we really aim to bring together medicine, science, and public health with the goal of, uh, of stopping human rights violations and also ensuring accountability where it occurs. We were founded in 1986 um, here in the US, although we now have offices, uh, in, we have an office in Kenya and we have um, a pr presence in DRC as well. Um, we have, so we are 
moving more and more into a, a more global, global footprint. We conduct investigations, expose findings, and advocate for change, as well as advocate, uh, educate professionals. The goal for PHR across all of our interventions is to create a culture for human rights amongst health professionals. And we've been doing this for uh, well over 30 years uh, of gathering evidence. And, and really, you can see, although it's, I don't know if it's blurry or not, but there's um, a range of different ways that we've done this, um, ranging from investigating uh, torture in Chile to working on the international campaign to ban landmines, for which we co we shared the uh, Nobel Peace Prize. Um, we worked on uh, providing evidence of genocide in, in, um, in Rwanda and also um, more recently, we've been working on trainings with uh, doctors, lawyers, police, and others uh, to, for, to support proper evidence collection in DRC, Kenya, and Syria. So taking a step back, the reason PHR works at this intersection is really recognizing um, the role that health professionals can play um, you know, for various reasons. One, health professionals have the ability to generate the kind of scientific evidence that is so critical to accountability processes um, for, for these kinds of human rights violations. Beyond that, I think it, it's not just the unique nature of the evidence that can be collected, but also you know, the respect that comes from accountability mechanisms when we think about the objectivity and credibility of the evidence that health professionals um, can, can generate and put forward. The influence of, of the profession is seen across um, you know, any, any legal, mechanism and forum. I come, as Nina had mentioned, from doing sexual and reproductive rights work for many years. Um, and what we saw constantly is that, you know, judges um, are, you know, they're very often, you know, when we seek accountability for sexual violence or other forms of gender-based violence that are faced by individuals, they need um, that additional evidence that comes from public health and from medicine to be able to really understand the patterns of abuse that occur and for them to really hold um, governments or others accountable when, for example, an abortion law is leading to um, to, to mental health impacts or, or other health impacts, they need to be able to see that evidence and really understand on a larger scale that it's not about an individual petitioner, but about a system uh, of harm that's being created. So the influence of the profession is, is really important um, because I think, you know, when judges are faced with an individual petitioner, they, they may see um, the case as, you know, through a specific lens, but when they have this kind of objective evidence that's documenting patterns of abuse, it is really critical in shifting mindsets and understanding the role of the state in, um, in, in ending these practices. Um, so, you know, provider, health professionals are also guided by ethical obligations that command significant respect within accountability processes. Um, and also can often draw on international language and communication. So, so recognize terms, recognition of crimes, you know, different, different terminology that's important to be able to speak across the different uh, constituencies that are responsible for ensuring accountability. And then of course, health is such a critical part of, um, you know, across a whole range of human rights. And so working with health professionals allows us to make the, the really critical links between the ways in which human rights violations lead to health harm the role of health in preventing human rights violations, and then even thinking about what, you know, we think about reparations and we think about remedy, um, how do we see the connections between health and human rights? So um, I think I've, I've discussed some of this, but you know, when, when we see uh, at PHR, what we've seen is human rights and the goals of healthcare professionals are, are really closely linked. Um, you know, we have the shared goal of alleviating suffering, of promoting conditions for health and well-being of all people. Historically, health professionals have, have sometimes been party to human rights abuses as well. And that's something that PHR also really works on is addressing where we see um, healthcare professionals supporting, condoning, or carrying out human rights abuses, such as what we saw, for example, um, around the, some forms of torture that, that are, were used uh, in Guantanamo Bay. We health professionals are also uniquely qualified to play a role in human rights investigation in documentation and advocacy, as well as in providing treatment to survivors of violations. And human rights principles, importantly, um, actually often already reflect the part, parts of, human, of health professionals codes of conduct, ethics and professional obligations. So this is where you can really see the, the way in which um, human rights influence and human rights principles and, and health principles come together. 
So health professionals have authority and weight to put pressure on governments that violate human rights. They are a respected voice. We often used to say when we did judicial trainings that judges, you know, rarely want to listen to um, to others. Um, you know, they'll, they'll rarely listen to anyone who isn't a judge, except when you put a health professional in front of them. And then, you know, they they suddenly open up their ears and they really see um, that there's a level of expertise that they they need to be hearing. So. The program on sexual violence in conflict zones at PHR um, works to really leverage this type of expertise to ensure accountability and effective prosecution for sexual violence. We support also collaborative grassroots networks, um, grassroots networks of medical, law enforcement, and legal stakeholders to improve the collection and documentation of forensic evidence for these crimes. So what is sexual violence and what is conflict-related sexual violence? Um, so there, aren't, there isn't a, a universal definition. It takes many forms and many countries' laws define sexual violence in different ways. But sexual violence affects everyone. It affects women, it affects men, it affects boys and girls. It affects people that are um, you know, in different, across the gender, across the, the gender spectrum. Um, sorry. Um, so every year, tens of thousands of women, girls, men, boys, and others are subject, subject to sexual violence during and after armed conflict. Um, so we work across this, this whole spectrum um, of forms of violence. So sexual violence, um, we often think of it as including rape. Uh, it's often called defilement in, in several um, legal, national legal systems. But it also includes a broader set of, of violations, including forced or coerced sexual contact of any kind, sexual slavery, forced prostitution, forced pregnancy or abortion, marital rape, sex trafficking, forced sterilization. Um, while the definition at the national level can be distinct, you know, internationally, these are all recognized as, as part of sexual violence. So the impact of sexual violence, um, you know, we often think of, of the impact at the at the individual level, um, which is critical, but it also impacts families, communities, and societies. So sexual violence can cause serious short and long-term physical, mental, and sexual and reproductive health problems for survivors. These harms can include injuries, including pelvic, genital, anal, or oral injuries, sometimes leading to death, unintended pregnancies, gynecological problems such as fistula, sexually transmitted infections, including HIV, or complications from abortions or lack of quality maternal health care, um, disability, and infertility. The stigma of sexual violence can also lead to mental health trauma, including depression, post-traumatic stress, and other anxiety disorders, eating disorders, and suicidal thoughts and behaviors, as well as high-risk health behavior, loss of interest in sexual activity or sexual dysfunction, um, and other health effects such as headaches or pain syndromes. But the health impacts um, really go beyond the individual. Uh, perpetrators have recognized the power of sexual violence to trigger ripple effects through families and communities. Women in particular um, who face a disproportionate amount of sexual violence are targeted not just as individuals, but often as supposed embodiments of their home, their family, their motherland, or the property of enemy groups. And where sexual violence is used as a strategy of war warfare, it destroys family ties, communities, and social norms, and inflicts harm over generations. It robs survivors and their families of their life potential and disrupts schooling and livelihoods. The stigma that's attached to rape often leads people to ostracize or even kill survivors, and that dynamic really rends the ties that bind families and communities, corroding people's ability to sustain each other through times of armed conflict and rendering communities even more vulnerable to conquest. CRSV can often also be used to impregnate women with the aim of eliminating certain groups or communities. So it's important to note that CRSV not only causes additional or destructive harms at all levels of society, but it's also a method to carry out other international crimes and a recognized early warning sign of the risks that those crimes may occur, notably with respect to forcible displacement and genocide. So yeah, sorry, I, I should have had this move. So what, you know, PHR is, is working across these different, um, you know, trying to document these different impacts. But one thing that we have seen in our work um, is that there's a specific gap that comes with the forensic evidence that's necessary uh, to prosecute sexual violence. Um, Tom, I think we can move to the next slide, I think. Um, so forensic evidence, um, 
Forensic medical exams are, are often rarely conducted. Medical charts fail to document the findings. There's often a lack of secure storage facilities. So even when um, the forensic evidence is documented, it then becomes compromised due to a range of different factors, including um, malicious actors, but also just, you know, weather and, you know, other kind of um, vulnerabilities. We often see that in pursuing um, cases of sexual violence, um, evidence becomes an issue because there's also lack of clarification of roles and who's doing what pieces of the forensic documentation. I think providers sometimes have the impression that, that this, you know, this evidence will be um, documented or generated um, by police, for example, as opposed to happening within the health facility itself. And forensic evidence and forensic examination is often not really even thought of as part of the sexual and reproductive health care and mental health care that a survivor needs when they come to a clinic. Um, we also see an absence of a shared language. And so what that means is that, you know, clinicians may use one set of terminology to describe uh, issues and then we'll see lawyers uh, or judges see using a totally different set of terms, not really being able to communicate effectively across to really understand the scope and nature of the violations that occurred or the evidence that was documented. And similarly, we also see poor coordination across legal, medical, and law enforcement sectors, which means that you know, a, a, for example, a, a, a medical form, the medical legal form may be filled out, but then by the time, you know, a survivor gets to court that, you know, there hasn't been that continuity of ensuring the evidence is preserved and transmitted um, the way it needs to be transmitted in order to be considered in, in the court case. So PHR works through a range of different strategies to try to address the, the obstacles that we just outlined, especially around forensic documentation. We work on capacity development, and that includes working with clinicians, with law enforcement, and others to really build that um, skill set to be able to do forensic documentation, to be able to do it well, um, you know, to think about uh, not just the sexual and reproductive health side of it, but also this, the mental health exams and being able to document that form of evidence, which is often lost in sexual violence cases. Um, and also to dispel myths and, and misconceptions that may lead to um, the type of evidence being collected to be being undermined or, or quality than it could be. We do that capacity development hand in hand with building networks and really trying to connect actors across um, the health, law enforcement, judicial sectors to be able to create um, a continuous sort of uh, source of a continuous circle of support for survivors as they're moving towards the justice system. And so really trying to connect to these actors in a way that, you know, when a case comes up, there's also the ability to ask questions and speak directly to each other, open up these lines of communication so that um, we're working together to advance accountability as opposed to each individual kind of taking their piece and not aware of, of where things are moving next. We also do advocacy. So for example, uh, we were just doing advocacy in, um, we've been doing advocacy for the last 10 years in DRC, moving towards the adoption of a medical legal certificate. Um, so a standardized form for forensic evidence for sexual violence. Um, and so that was a process where PHR intensively worked on developing uh, a model form and then, you know, through consultation with experts um, and then moved to engaging with uh, the government and others to, to advocate for its adoption. Um, and so that, that's an example. We also do support court cases. We have public interest litigation, for example, pending in Kenya um, around election related sexual violence that occurred in 2007 to 2008. Um, where we're really seeking recognition of state responsibility for sexual violence occurring during this election period, um, and also the obligation of the state to provide remedy and reparations where, um, where such violence occurred. We also conduct research, um, and Tom will share a little bit more from one of our case studies around how we do that. So I, I'll, I'll pause, uh, I'll leave that one um, without more depth right now. Um, but the last thing we also do is develop tools, resources, and technologies. And one thing I was really excited by when I came to PHR um, is actually that PHR really thinks about techno technological solutions to the kinds of issues that we've outlined. So for example, um, you know, where we see that um, the security of the, date of the evidence of sexual violence, these forms, they're often completed. Um, but then they're stored in, in settings that are not very secure. And so they're really vulnerable to being destroyed, lost, or tampered with. Um, so PHR, through a, a very um, collaborative co-design process, has developed a mobile application called Medicapt, which is being used in Kenya and in DRC 
to in, in facilities where clinicians have access to a tablet that has this mobile application with, um, you know, essentially to support filling out the forensic, uh, the, the medical legal certificate to support filling that out with, you know, through the forensic uh, evidence uh, examination process. And then that evidence, um, that form is stored in the cloud. And so it, it's no longer just a physical document sitting in an unlocked room or in, in a facility that's really not secure, um, but rather is in a secure setting and is much more um, able to be kept safe and until necessary for, for court cases. So I think I've, I've gone through some of the, these examples, um, but essentially we're working on enhancing uh, capacities for clinicians, police officers, lawyers, and judges to collect, document, and preserve and safely transmit forensic evidence of sexual violence across medical legal sectors to support accountability and prosecution of these crimes. And we're working on mobilizing multi-sectoral professionals to coordinate with each other to improve collection and documentation of evidence of sexual violence. We're also working to collaborate with partners to bring about systemic change in survivor-centered medical legal response and prevention through the advocacy that I'd outlined earlier, as well as policy reforms and sharing of best practices. So I'll pause there and turn it over to Tom to share um, a more concrete case study. Thanks so much, Pyle. It's really great um, to be with all of you uh, today. Um, so again, I'm Tom McHale. I'm the Deputy Director of the Program on Sexual Violence and Conflict Zones at PHR. Um, and we thought I would talk us through a um, case study of um, research that PHR has been working on over the past few years on sexual violence committed against the Rohingya um, in um, an ethnic minority in Myanmar um, from the perspectives of working with healthcare workers. Um, so kind of where are we going? It's always easier to kind of absorb the information if we have a clear roadmap of, of where we're headed. Um, so, you know, I, I will talk a little bit about the background of the, the situation in Myanmar um, that we are um, working on documenting and partnering with other partners um, on. Um, talk about some of the data caps, um, what gaps were there um, that we were seeing on the ground um, that helped us understand where to um, conduct a research study. Um, and then I'll do a little bit of an overview of the research study, the methodology, um, findings, conclusions, and what do we hope to do next? Um, I think one thing that separates an organization like PHR doing research um, from um, other areas um, is that we, the, the work actually starts um, when the, the research is done. We want to get that research um, into the right hands so it can be used for social change, whether that's a court case, for advocacy, or other uh, venues. Um, we want to collect um, rigorous um, data and information and package it in ways so others can use it to promote human rights and accountability. Um, so a little bit of background, um, not everyone may be familiar, um, but the Rohingya are a Muslim minority in Myanmar who have faced persecution for decades. Um, and while we're focusing on um, the situation of the Rohingya, PHR has worked for a number of years on human rights violations in Myanmar um, across different ethnic minorities. And we are currently um, working to document um, attacks on healthcare after the um, after the the coup last year in uh, in Myanmar, um, but focusing on the Rohingya for for this case study, um, in August 2017, Myanmar's armed forces, known as the Tatmadaw um, and security forces, committed widespread and systematic um, violence against the Rohingya in Myanmar's northern Rakhine state. That's um, what you see here in red. Um, these clearance our operations were, in the words of a 2018 UN um, independent fact-finding mission, they were brutal and grossly disproportionate. Um, they targeted hundreds of villages and the entire Rohingya population. This violence caused more than 720,000 Rohingya to flee um, for Myanmar, um, um, flee Myanmar for Bangladesh um, between August um, 2017 and July um, 2019. Most of these 720,000 refugees arrived in the first three months of the crisis, creating the world's largest refugee camp in, in the district of Cox's Bazar. As the Rohingya were um, arrived, um, you know, it was clear that they had experienced serious human rights violations, including sexual violence that were committed during these um, um, clearance, so-called clearance operations. Um, a variety of actors, um, not just PHR, but other human rights organizations, local activists, UN fact-finding missions, and others, found that the attacks against the Rohingya communities were excessively violent, widespread, methodical, and committed on a massive scale. 
Um, the UN fact-finding mission even said that these constituted crimes against humanity, war crimes, and underlying acts of genocide um, that were accompanied by um, it, um, genocidal intent. PHR, um, we also helped to document, um, you know, this widespread and systematic nature of, of the violent acts. And just to give us a, you know, um, an understanding of what, um, what, what happened during this kind of reign of terror by the, the Myanmar military junta, um, you know, PHR um, partnered with an academic partner to um, survey um, um, community leaders in, um, from, from different hamlets in Myanmar. Um, who themselves were actually tasked with um, sharing population data on a regular basis with the with the with the government in, in Myanmar. This is important because they actually had uh, understanding of the size of their um, of their hamlets over time. Um, as community leaders, they also had insights into things that happened um, in the um, in their communities. This allowed PHR to do a research project to, at a population level, um, document. Um, widespread and systematic violence. And to give us a sense of what was happening, 91% of those Hamlet leaders um, um, interviewed, so meaning 91% of the, um, of the, of the um, Rohingya Hamlet said that people were beaten um, or injured with weapons. 63% um, said that, that religious leaders were targeted. 55% said that people were shot. Um, 9% said that people were gang raped and 28% that people were raped or sexually assaulted. And knowing what we know about the stigma of sexual violence that, that Pyle um, spoke about earlier, if 9% of the male Hamlet leaders said that people were gang raped in their communities and 28% said that people were um, raped or sexually assaulted, imagine what the true incidence of sexual violence is in these communities. If um, if that's what actually was able to pierce through this extreme stigma um, um, to, for it to get to, to male community leaders to, to see. 79% um, said that um, farms were or fields were burned and 65% said that mosques were destroyed or burned. Um, these um, data that were um, collected um, by a PHR team and published in the Lancet um, Planetary Health um, in a study called Violence and Mortality um, in Northern Rakhine State um, of Myanmar, um, the results of a quantitative um, survey of community leaders in, in Bangladesh. Um, this shows the widespread and systematic nature of um, the violence against the Rohingya and helped to counter um, balance um, act um, some of those um, government of Myanmar narratives that these were isolated incidents. This is also important information for justice and account uh, accountability. Um, but we share this um, data, not because we're going to go deep into this study, um, but it's important data to really help understand and frame that the sexual violence that we will um, be speaking about um, in, in this presentation in Myanmar that PHR documented um, did not happen in a vacuum. It did not happen in isolation. It, was, it, it came as part of a, a wave of terror um, across um, this uh, pop population. Um, it is against this background and this previous research that we really tried to build upon our next study. As uh, public health researchers, we always, you know, first look at, 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 at what's out there. As human rights activists, we also look at what, we don't just look at what, what, what data gaps there are to fill, but we also look at what data gaps there are that will be helpful for others trying to ensure um, accountability or, or other human rights goals. So here, um, we know that there is, um, not much information about the long-term impacts of sexual and gender-based violence on Rohingya population. We knew it happened, but we don't, um, there wasn't information about, you know, checking in at different intervals afterwards. Um, there was not any systematic documentation of the experiences of healthcare workers. As Pyle shared earlier, healthcare workers occupy um, a very um, privileged space in our, in our society, in many societies around the world. Um, and those experiences, um, because of what they've been able to access as, as providers of care, had, had not been documented in this context. Um, there were few methodologically rigorous studies documenting SGBV in this population. Um, while there was a lot of um, documentation of sexual and gender-based violence, um, a lot of the, um, the documentation that happened used more journalistic methods that were appropriate for the emergency um, phase, just really finding out what happened. Um, and finally, um, there was a gap in survivor-centered research methodologies that did not lead to 
over documentation or um, re-traumatization. Um, there was tale of one survivor who spoke 60, 70, 80 times to others, um, recounting their story again and again and again. Um, for some survivors, that, that, that may be empowering. For others, they may feel they have no choice and could lead to, to, over, um, um, to re traumatization um, and over documentation. So, with these ga um, data gaps in mind, um, the team here at PHR, um, we worked with, with our partners um, to develop a research study to document and explore patterns of inju injuries and conditions suffered by Rohingya refugees seen in Bangladesh soon after August 2017, with a specific focus on sexual violence. We wanted to learn about the injuries related to this violence, identify the barriers and facilitators to delivering care to Rohingya refugees in, in Bangladesh, and to identify those barriers and facilitators to evaluating or documenting human rights abuses. While we wanted to understand, of course, what happened in Myanmar, we also wanted to understand the impacts of that violence uh, of them um, that, that Rohingya experienced in Bangladesh. Um, we, we see violence as a continuum. It is not just the act, uh, but it's everything else that is related to those acts um, that, are, um, that impact the, the, the individual. So when we think about violence, we think about violence in, in not just the violent act, but also everything around that and that ecosystem of violence um, or structural violence. So what do we do? Um, I will also say this is against the um, onset of the pandemic. Um, so we also had to think of um, research methodologies that not only helped us reach those research goals, but also could be done safely and rigorously uh, during the pandemic. Um, so we developed a project where we conducted one-on-one -on -one semi-structured interviews with 26 healthcare workers who provided direct services to Rohingya refugees in, in Bangladesh. The sample size, as we're good qualitative researchers, was determined by data saturation. Um, so that's the point where we were going through our, our research every time we did a few interviews and saw that we weren't hearing any new stories or um, the, the themes that were emerging had already been documented before. Data collected was collected in two phases between November 2019 and August 2020. Um, because of the logistical challenges, um, some of them had to do with the pandemic, others had to do with um, access um, to, um, to places where we could conduct the interviews. Um, all of the interviews um, were, were conducted uh, remotely. Um, and we decided on this methodology for a few reasons. A, like I said, few studies have documented the experience of Rohingya refugees through the lens of the people who, who cared for them. Um, healthcare workers are often the first people to whom a survivor may consider disclosing their, their trauma and can serve as a proxy to avoid re-traumatization of survivors. This research methodology allowed PHR to elicit stories in anonymous ways about survivor experiences from trusted members of the community who have specific professional training to allow them to understand what they're seeing um, and to put that into context. This provides an independent corroboration of the patterns of violence. Um, this is important because many um, uh, actors who commit human rights violations, first step is denial. Um, we've seen that um, recently in Bucha in, in Ukraine um, where um, alleged perpetrators are saying that didn't happen. Um, that's fake news. Um, having this independent corroboration of these patterns of violence allows um, um, activists and others to counterbalance and counter um, that narrative um, and provide that independent um, validation. Um, so what did we learn in this research project? Um, first, the survivor's experiences, the patterns of sexual violence. Most of the cases are very familiar. Um, and this quote from a nurse midwife in Kutapalong camp, um, said that families killed in front of them and raped, survivors escaped um, into the bush and across the border. Um, this pattern um, is very important. Patterns are very important for the ju judicial process. Um, um, and this um, research helped us through um, speaking to healthcare pro providers, identify um, those patterns of, uh, patterns of perpetration. Um, Again, with those patterns. Another key pattern is she was raped by one of the Myanmar military personnel. Healthcare workers in, in, in Bangladesh heard time and time again that the, pers that the persons who perpetrated the violence um, and sexual violence in particular against um, Rohingya were members of the Myanmar military. 
Um, we also heard um, about, you know, women in particular and young women um, in particular actually being taken and locked into houses and gang raped. Um, so not just hearing tale, um, stories and testimony of individual sexual violence, but also gang rape. Um, we also heard about not just those experiences of the sexual violence itself, but also um, uh, disclosure, you know. Um, so here in this quote from an, a nurse practitioner working in, in, in Kutubalon camp said that um, a survivor came in with complaints of vaginal discharge. Um, so um, the, the, the healthcare professional conducted an exam and it's the course of, of that exam, the healthcare professional uncovered other trauma um, and um, started asking questions about the, the trauma based on the physical findings. The survivor then disclosed an experience of sexual violence. This is an important finding um, that comes out of this research and something to really um, put into context as we think about, um, as we've talked about a few times now, the stigma. Um, this survivor may not have disclosed the sexual violence to anyone. Um, and healthcare professionals are in a unique position to actually, um, because they are um, in many cases, the first person to whom many survivors disclose the experiences of sexual and gender-based violence. Um, this was a way to capture um, this experience and also show that there are likely many survivors um, whose experiences have not been documented and helping us think about that, that widespread um, um, scale of the sexual and gender-based violence. Um, mental health, um, you know, many um, healthcare professionals spoke about um, the deep trauma um, that was, um, um, that Rohingya survivors um, are experiencing, including um, suicidal thoughts, um, you know, crying during uh, medical exams, et cetera. Um, this is important because it shows that the violence um, is not just that one act in Myanmar, but a long, t there's actually a long tail of the violence and the damages that are um, incur that are um, um, experienced by, um, because of the, that violence, um, you know, continue um, for years and years afterwards. Um, there's actually studies from the um, 90s and 2000s um, speaking to um, German um, women living in Austria um, to show that they still exhibit signs of PTSD and trauma after experiencing sexual and gender-based violence in World War II. Um, so those, um, you know, that, that, that trauma sticks with you um, for, you know, a lifetime. Um, even against all of this um, great need, um, we also documented that, um, you know, the providers had many, many, many patients. So there were patients who needed deep care um, and they, each healthcare provider would see 80 or 90 patients a day. You know, this uh, even shows that even what, what has been documented may not even show that the, the, the full scale and scope and show that the, there are not adequate services being uh, delivered um, in this difficult context for uh, survivors. Um, there was um, limited privacy. Um, so here one uh, health professional talked about a, um, a clinic made of thin bamboo walls. Um, as we discussed earlier, disclosing sexual and gender-based violence is a, is a difficult topic, uh, is difficult to do. And doing it when um, privacy is not assured um, may, may prevent uh, survivors from disclosing. Um, we also noted that there were challenges um, with intercultural communication and um, translators um, so that um, many times the um, uh, a Rohingya survivor was actually having to translate their experiences through a male translator um, and, and, and mediating um, their, um, to, to mediate the sharing of their, um, their experience with a healthcare provider, which um, we know can actually become a barrier to access to care. Um, for, for those who may not be comfortable um, speaking to someone of the opposite gender about sexual and gender-based violence. Um, stigma, um, so there's a lot of shame in communities and this was um, documented um, by healthcare professionals and, um, and showing that they are still seeing stigma um, from the sexual and gender-based violence even today as, as they see patients. Um, limited resources, um, you know, mental health um, access was difficult and that's something that um, healthcare professionals noted that there, need, there is a need for um, mental health care services, um, but there is limited uh, resources in 2018. Um, 
you know, um, legal access. Um, th there was difficulty accessing legal um, uh, s support um, because of, you know, I'm um, oh, sorry, there's difficulty accessing um, other kinds of um, support in Bangladesh because of the um, status of Rohingya refugees in Bangladesh um, itself. Um, many in Bangladesh, the um, um, Rohingya refugees have um, a temporary status. They actually don't have um, refugee status, um, which um, makes it difficult for them to access any services outside of the camps, which are overcrowded, um, they're prone to violence. Um, and um, as of late, there have actually been a number of fires um, that have made it difficult to, to, to live there. Um, so what are our conclusions? And we kind of went through the data. Those are the raw data. And here's kind of the meaning that we found from it. First, sexual violence was widespread and committed against Rohingya women, girls, men, boys, third gender and transgender individuals. There was deep cultural pressure and stigma to remain silent. So there are potentially many survivors who have not sought care. There are unmet needs for mental health support and post-violence um, um, care. Um, and the Rohingya refugees experience repeated trauma, not just sexual violence, not just beating, um, not just burning of fields, not just forced witnessing, but this layering effect of different um, traumatic experiences. So what do we do next? Um, I think for PHR, it's important not just to um, publish the study. Um, we are we use academic methods, but we aren't academics. So. Um, you know, our goal isn't to just publish, but our goal is to get information out there so that it can be shared with international justice, accountability, um, and, and, and other actors. Um, so we've been sharing the public um, findings in a few different forums. So we had a report launch. Um, we actually had a report launch, um, a public one, but we also had one um, closed door sessions with key international actors to get the information in the right hands so they can act. Um, and, and, and policy meetings where we actually go through the findings and help others who are using um, this to craft policy at the national and international levels, whether in the U.S. advocating for a Burma Act or um, in, um, in international venues like the U.N., um, as well as report back to humanitarian actors. Um, we actually um, um, shared these data with partners um, working in the U.N. cluster system in, in, in Bangladesh so that um, healthcare professionals, um, organizations providing services, um, and other actors can understand these findings and use it to improve services. Um, um, these data are meaningless if someone can't um, use it to, um, to, to make change. Um, we've published um, this um, information is, as a report, um, Sexual Violence, Trauma, and Neglect, um, that was um, published on um, PHR's website um, in 2020. And then just a few days ago, um, we published a, um, a, a version of the study in BMC Public Health um, called Most of the Cases Are Very Similar, Documenting Corroborating Conflict-Related Sexual Violence Affecting Rohingya Refugees. That um, research is actually open access, um, where else we commit to paying extra so that anyone around the world can access um, these um, information and it's not hidden behind a paywall. Um, we also actually, um, our PHR paper, we, we published in Bengali as well, um, so that that research is accessible for healthcare professionals working in the, um, in, in, in the, in the camps to, to help improve services. Um, we are also um, publishing a few other um, papers um, on other topics that came up in the qualitative research that is helpful for us to use in additional advocacy. Um, so going deeper in mental health, um, looking at the impacts of COVID-19, um, because the, um, the study was being um, conducted at that same time. Finally, um, for us, it's really important to share these research uh, methodologies to promote the use of methods that avoid re-traumatization re over documentation of survivors. Um, so that for us, it's a very important um, to not only share what we've learned and how to push for social change that way, um, but also change how we as researchers um, um, redefine um, our research so that it is at most empowering um, and doesn't, um, and doesn't re, 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 re traumatize survivors. So I'll pause there. Uh, big thanks uh, from me and Pyle. I have our email addresses there. So if you have any any questions. We're actually both from Philadelphia, so it's nice to have this uh, nice full circle uh, Philly global health, human rights, uh, and justice conversation. So thanks for listening, and we're excited about questions. 
Thank you so much. So that was an excellent talk. I loved the overview. It was great to hear about the accountability and legal side and the case study in Myanmar about the Rohingya was just so detailed and rich in terms of the public health background as well. So I have a lot of questions, but I am not going to hog the floor. I see we have some questions in the Q&A, and I will remind our attendees to either put their hands up or send the um, send your questions in the Q&A so we can give them to Pyle and Tom. So I'll start with the first one. So this attendee is wondering, is there a risk when interviewing health workers as informants about human rights violations that you will make them vulnerable to targeted attacks and or retribution? So that I'll, I'll pass over to either Pyle or Tom and you can take that one. Uh, thanks so much. Maybe I'll start off. Um, you know, it is a very good question. And the answer is yes. And it's something that we um, work very hard to do um, to make sure that um, we are doing our research projects in safe and ethical ways. Um, so for us, the first um, the first um, kind of layer for us is safety planning. Um, we go through very rigorous planning processes. Um, it, ethical review boards. And we even have actually a PHR institutional review board as well, um, where we go through not only is this research ethical to do, but what are the unique human rights concerns that don't usually come up in those academic um, verification um, uh, processes. The next layer for us is, is informed consent. Um, and informed consent for us, um, you know, our consent forms are actually super long um, and we have a lot of different kind of tiered levels of consent. So it's not just, would you like to consent in this research project? It's, do you want your name to be known even to us? Do you want us to use your image? Um, can we share this data for accountability? So really providing um, a detailed understanding of what we're doing and sharing all of those different levels. Um, you know, there's even times and we don't even know who our, um, um, partners who we're speaking to are. Um, we'll use um, encrypted email, um, et cetera, um, pseudonyms. Um, we actually are training health professionals on documenting sexual violence in one, um, another context, and they don't know our names. Um, you know, and so those are kinds of things where we actually help um, um, understand where our partners are. Um, I, I will say we also want to empower healthcare professionals, and some people want to stand up and want to um, you know, tell the world what, of what has happened. Um, so we also don't want to, um, we wanna share the real risks, but we also want to also empower others to speak up as well and not make decisions for others, um, thinking that you know, I, I may know, know best for my perch here in Boston. Thanks so much, Tom. Um, one of the other questions that we actually had was sharing the links to the publications, and I see Pyle has already done that in the chat. So for those of you who are on the call, please feel free to take a look, look at those links as well. And we can send those out in, in a message after the, the webinar as well. And then we have another more of a comment comments slash question. So the attendee mentioned that, um, so in your talk, you mentioned a high percentage of Rohingya refugees reported violence, but they're curious about that, how generalizable that is into the general population, since the people that are reporting that they're aware of the violence, but it had not specifically targeted them and there's selections and other biases in asking those who fled, but not those who had stayed behind. So how did you, take um, representation or bias into account when you were thinking about how to structure the research project? Um, yes and yes. You know, um, there is a great back and forth in Lancet um, Planetary Health on, on methodology. So I'd encourage you to check that out in the journal um, and go deep there. I, I will say um, you cannot ever do a perfect research study in, um, in, 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 in difficult environments. Um, this, um, the methodology that we talked about for that other study, and I wasn't completely involved in it, but I, I, I know it well enough, um, took into account as best as we could that population level aspect by speaking to Hamlet leaders who themselves had to um, share precise population counts um, as part of the, the structural violence that they um, um, experienced to the Myanmar authorities. So they did have a sense of overall population structure. While the goal was not um, 
the goal, but however, was not to actually have a complete count of the number of um, of um, experiences of shootings or sexual violence. It was actually to understand the widespread and systematic nature. And proving that itself is a wonderful um, um, thing for justice, uh, because you know to prove these crimes against humanity, to prove that war crimes happen. One aspect is. Um, is you have to say these aren't just isolated incidents, but it's a widespread and systematic uh, nature that raises um, th that that elevates um, that level. So for us as human rights activists, that was our our public health goal. It wasn't to show prevalence so that you know we could say seventy nine percent of women in 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 in, in Rohingya communities experience X, Y, or Z, but actually to show that because that is very very important um, and it's um, um, for the justice process. Thanks, Tom. And I see we have Amelia Hoover Green who's raised her hand. Amelia, I'm going to allow you to talk on Zoom. So let me know if this works and you can ask your question. <clears throat> Hi. Great. Oh, sorry. My camera appears to be off. Um, so first of all, hi, Pyle. Um, hi, good to see you. <laughs> um, turns out both sexual violence researchers. Um, so I'm really, I'm interested in sort of based on my experiences in some other contexts in what sometimes seems to me to be a, almost a conflict between attempts to document crimes of war and attempts to show that crimes of war um, and atrocities more generally account, like amount to crimes against humanity, right? The widespread and systematic magic words um, can often, it, my, my particular experience um, with that conflict is in Colombia where there was a shift in advocacy strategy from prosecuting individual cases to attempting ultimately fruitlessly to fruitlessly, is that a thing? Who knows? Um, to show that crimes of sexual violence in the Colombian Civil War were widespread and systematic. And I think, um, you know, one of the difficulties that showed up was actually with trying to use numerical data to show what was and was not widespread and systematic, what counted, et cetera. And, you know, those are, are those are our sort of poorly defined terms um, for a lot of for a lot of us who work as social scientists. I'm just interested to know whether PHR institutionally or either of you personally has had sort of experience strategizing around, okay, is this something where we are attempting to get local accountability or is this something where we are looking further ahead to an international criminal tribunal? Have you ever seen a conflict arise between those two goals? Uh, so thank you. Maybe I can respond briefly about the sexual violence work in Myanmar and then Pyle, I can turn over to you as that's your larger area of expertise. Um, but you know, for us, um, accountability in Myanmar was not on the table. Um, the Tatmadaw wasn't hearing about it. They even committed a coup, <laughs> um, and we started documenting um, attacks on health. And it's another link, link I can put on the um, it's on, it's in the New York Times yesterday, so I can put that in the um, I can put that in the chat. But um, you know, for us, you know, we had to focus internationally because those domestic spaces were were unavailable. I think it's a great question. You know, I, I'm I'm relatively new to PHR, so I, I only joined last year. But I, I think that, um, you know, in general, as we think about where we're seeking accountability, you know, right now our program actually is, is quite focused um, on local level accountability. It's actually really looking um, at individual cases and pursuing accountability in, in DRC in particular. Um, and then in Kenya, we have public interest litigation that's broader, that is about bringing together um, petitioners who survivor petitioners, but also broader organizations and really looking um, at, at kind of at it's 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 meant to show state accountability on a larger scale. Um, but I don't know if we've I don't know if like I, I think the way that our, our 
like I don't know if we have a, a full strategy. I think the question you were asking is like, do we have an approach on okay, well, do we do we do it this way or that way? I, I think that what we're trying to do is generate the evidence where we can and to work um, with the partners. And, and I think there is a question that's also about like how is our how do we decide where we're doing our work? Um, and I think a lot of that connects. It I think a bit it's a bit more organic. We're not a legal organization when it comes down to it. So we're not running a case strategy from start to finish that way. And actually for me, actually coming from a legal organization, it's been a bit of a shift, right? To really think about our role as not articulating the strategy writ large and then identifying who is going to be generating the evidence. It's actually, our, our work is really first thinking about, okay, you know, we're hearing that there's cases. So even in Ukraine, you know, we're being approached around there's cases, you know, we need to work on documentation. How do we work on documentation? It's happening a lot more organically as opposed to here's the strategy and the accountability mechanism we're going to end up putting our claim in front of um, and then working backwards there. That said, obviously, we, we understand what the, the quality of evidence needs to be to be able to um, to influence the accountability and justice processes. And that's kind of where, where Tom was, you know, outlining, you know, with the Myanmar research and the and Bangladesh research in, in general, what we're looking at is where are the gaps? What are others not able to show or haven't yet shown that we could really mobilize and fill that gap around? Um, so I think the evidence, it, it comes in different ways, um, but I don't know, I wouldn't say that we, you know, we're, when we're designing our strategy that, that that's what we're looking across um, it, because we're not a legal organization in the end. So we're not trying to limit the evidence we're generating to one, specific, whether it's, uh, you know, war crimes versus crimes against humanity versus, you know, it, it's not um, in that lens. Um, but I, I will say, I think for us, what is different is the the rigor um, that we're able to use to for that documentation and the research. I think it's, um, you know, and, and that's, I think, you know, why someone like me who went to public health school um, does something like this, you know, we, we gain those skills and now we, we can deploy them. So when the evidence is ready to go to court, it's really hard to say this is fake because we can sit there and we can go through in such boring detail how we did the research. And I think this is something for me as a public health professional and you know, any students out there listening, I think is really empowering. Like, you know, we have such amazing skills from public health schools that we can deploy to fight the pandemic or we can use it in this way to fight the bad people. You know, and I, I do think that is really empowering as a public health professional to to see how we can put our heads down and do something really complicated um, with um, information and package it in a way that is um, that that is ultimately useful. Um, so, you know, I always struggled. I say this just because when I was in public health school, I was like, how am I going to work in human rights? I'm not a lawyer. You know, my advisor in public health school was even a lawyer. Um, but, you know, I, um, I, I realized that there's such power um, in being able to do work in this way, to work meaningfully um, in equal partnership with um, close partners. You know, our next research project we're actually planning is um, a community-based participatory action research, you know? So let's turn even the, um, the frameworks for like how we do rigorous research upside down. Um, so I just say that it's just, you know, not fully an answer to, to, to the question, but just kind of, um, wanted to share that for students like this is how you can be um, human rights activists um, and, and stay in the, in the public health sector. Thank you so much, Tom. I mean, I couldn't even sum up the webinar even better than what you have just said. I mean, at the core and ethos of the Drone Type School of Public Health is recognition that health is a human right. And our founding dean, Jonathan Mann, strongly believed in that. And that is an ethos that's still in the school. So the fact that you've just highlighted how your degree in public health, how your training, how your experience really ties in to accountability and justice and advancing public health and human rights and you know, medical doctors, law enforcement, it, as we've seen in this presentation has been invaluable. And so we're at time and I just wanna thank so much to PHR and in particular to Pyle and Tom for their time, for sharing their experiences. And I would like to say a huge thank you to you and your partners and colleagues. And for those of you who haven't, um, who weren't aware of PHR before this presentation, I encourage you to check out their website and look at the studies that they've published as well as the reports, and also think about how you might wanna make a contribution to the health and human rights field in whatever way you'd like. So 
thanks so much and have a nice day.